Hello, and welcome to the Verification Academy and session six of Advanced UVM Layered Sequences. I'm Tom Fitzpatrick, Strategic Verification Architect here at Siemens EDA, and this session will show you how to coordinate the execution of sequences on multiple agents in UVM. Let's get started. In UVM, most sequences are run on sequencers. There's typically one sequencer per agent. The environment may define a default sequence to run on that sequencer. And when you do that, the sequence can be overridden via the factory, which is typically done from the test. The test can also define other sequences to run on that sequencer. And those sequences will then run in parallel. And the driver will get a transaction from one or the other as the test proceeds. The sequences generate those sequence items. They send them to the driver, and the driver then sends them to the bus. Now, typically, a DUT will have more than one interface. So an interesting test requires coordinating multiple sequences on those multiple interfaces. So you may have the environment set default sequences on each of them, or you may have the test define different sequences to run on those different agents. Now, each of those sequences will send transactions to the appropriate driver, and then the driver will interact with the DUT on the different interfaces. In order to coordinate the execution of sequences on multiple sequencers like this, the UVM includes the concept of something called a virtual sequence. As we'll see, the difference between a sequence and a virtual sequence is that while a sequence generates transactions, a virtual sequence just manages the execution of other sequences. Notice that we don't have to specify the request or response type for the base UVM sequence because it defaults to the UVM sequence item. So our base virtual sequence type here we'll call it myVSeqBase, will simply be extended from the UVM sequence type. And it will contain handles to the two sequencers on which the sequences will execute. Now from the test, before we run that virtual sequence, we need to initialize it and set up the sequencer pointers. So we have to tell it exactly which sequencers it's going to run on. We do this from the test because the test knows what the layout of our environment is and where it wants the sequences controlled by the virtual sequence to execute. And then we start that sequence. In the previous session, we saw that sequences typically start on a sequencer, but a virtual sequence does not. So when we call start on the virtual sequence, we pass in the null handle to indicate that it's not running on any particular sequencer. In the body method of the virtual sequence, we can start the different sequences that we want on those sequencers. Notice that the virtual sequence coordinates the execution of the sequences, but to make this virtual sequence reusable, we don't hard code the sequencer paths in the virtual sequence at all. Instead, it's the test that defines on which interfaces the transactions eventually get executed. So now we have a sequence whose job it is to start two other sequences on whatever sequencers it's told to run them on, so that they can send transactions to the different interfaces of your device. This is the definition of a virtual sequence. That's all fine, but it would be helpful to simplify the initialization of this virtual sequence. In our base test, we'll create a method called init virtual sequence. That will take the virtual sequence as an argument, and we use that to set up the sequencer pointers in the virtual sequence. So in the virtual sequence, we have two sequencers, A sequencer and B sequencer and we pass into those the particular sequencers in the environment that we're using. The sequencer paths should be the same for all extensions of this base test, but you do have the option of overriding the definition of init vseq in other test extensions if you need to. Now, when we extend the base test into our particular test, and we can just call init vsequence, and it will automatically take care of setting those sequencer pointers in the virtual sequence. In order to use the virtual sequence in a test, we're going to extend that base test into something we'll call init vseq test. Remember, this extension of test base includes all of the functionality from the base test, including the initialization method that we just defined. So we construct the test. And then in the run phase, we will create an instance of the vseq ab virtual sequence, just like we would for any other sequence. Then we raise the objection, as we've mentioned before, to make sure that the test doesn't exit before we actually run the sequences. We call the initialization method from the base test to set the sequencer pointers in the virtual sequence. And then we simply start the virtual sequence. 
The virtual sequence will execute calling the two subsequences, or however many we have, which will execute the transactions to the drivers to interact with the dot. Then when the virtual sequence is complete, that is when the two subsequences, or however many we have, have completed executing, we can drop the objection from the run phase of the test and the test will exit and complete our test. Let's look a little more closely at a virtual sequence. This is an object that we register with the factory using UVM object utils. It has the standard object constructor where we call super.new. Remember, the base sequence is where we declared the handles to the two sequencers we'll use to run the sequences. We declare the two subsequences that we're going to execute. And then in the body method, we use the factory to create instances of these two sequences. Then we use a fork join statement to run the two of them in parallel, or we can do whatever else we want to do. We can run them sequentially, we can start other sequences, it depends on our application. Notice in this case, we're starting these two sequences, A and B, on the specific sequencers that were declared in the base sequence. So we start the A sequence on sequencer A and the B sequence on sequencer B, and rely on the test to call init vseq to assign these sequencer handles in the virtual sequence to actual sequencers in the environment. An alternative approach is to use a new component that we'll call a virtual sequencer. We extend this from the base UVM sequencer component and register it with the factory. Inside the virtual sequencer, we'll declare handles for the sequencers on which the subsequences will eventually run. Since this component is extended from a UVM base class, we call super.new from its constructor. In the environment, we instantiate the virtual sequencer along with the agents we'll need, which just happen to have sequencers that match the sequencer types we declared in our virtual sequencer. But since we're dealing with components here, we use the connect phase to make the actual assignments of the virtual sequencer handles to the agent sequencers. Since we're using the virtual sequencer, our virtual sequence base type will be a little different. Just like in the previous example, the virtual sequence base has handles to the target sequencers. But this base virtual sequence also has a handle to the virtual sequencer on which it is going to run. We'll see why that is in a minute. In the body task, the first thing we have to do is to make sure that the sequencer pointer is of the correct type. Every sequence has a built-in sequencer pointer assigned when the sequence is started on a sequencer, in this case a virtual sequencer, which is returned by get sequencer. We cast this to the vseeker to provide context to the virtual sequence when it calls its subsequences. Now we can assign the sequencer handles to the appropriate sequencers, but notice that these are all relative to the vsequencer handle in the virtual sequence base type. This lets the virtual sequence and corresponding virtual sequencer run in any environment that has agent sequencers of the required types. Then we extend the base virtual sequence to our specific virtual sequence for this test. We declare the two subsequences that we'll be running. Then in the body method, we create instances of our two subsequences. And then we can start those sequences on the sequencer handles we assigned in the base class. Up in the test, all we have to do in the run phase is create the virtual sequence and start it on the virtual sequencer in the environment. All of the subsequencer paths have already been set in the virtual sequence base class and the environment. It's really up to you which method you choose to run virtual sequences. The first way I showed you with the init vseek method defined in the test provides a little more flexibility and simplifies the hierarchy of your design. The virtual sequencer method lets you reuse the virtual sequencer in any environment that contains the desired subsequencers, but you'll have to make the assignments in your environment and you have to instantiate the virtual sequencer. It really comes down to whether you want to specify the subsequencers in the test or in the environment. As I said, it's really up to you. Now, there are often times where we have hierarchical protocols in our device, like PCI Express, USB 3.0, and others. There's typically things like a transaction layer, a transport layer, a physical layer, or whatever. All layers are similar and related, but they have different information that is required at each different level. There are also other cases where we want to start with a protocol-independent layer, like a generic protocol or a generic payload in TLM 2.0, 
and then maybe go from there to a specific protocol such as AMBA AHB or whatever. So we need to be able to understand how to go from one protocol level to another. So this will require that all the sequence items that we have have to be deconstructed from the high level down to the low level and then reconstructed on the way back up. Now, this construction and deconstruction can be done in one to many fashion. So you may have one high level transaction that breaks out into lower level transactions. Or you may have a many to one where you have several transactions that you use to compose a lower level transaction. And then as you're going the opposite direction, obviously you have to do the opposite operation. So we want to be able to set up an environment that makes it easy to handle these kinds of protocols in a familiar and reusable way. Remember, we want to execute sequences from the test because that's where we decide what to do to actually verify the target functionality of our DUT. So we start the sequence on a sequencer and we want to be able to reuse as much of this infrastructure as possible. So we have the protocol agent that's connected to the bus and we want to be able to reuse this agent and also maintain this understanding of sequencers and monitors at higher levels of abstraction. To add a layer on top of this protocol, we still want this thing to look like it's an agent. So we still want the sequence to run on a sequencer, and we still want to have a monitor that's going to report the activity that we saw at the lower level. In the agent, that monitor is reporting the activity that it saw on the bus, but at the next layer up, we want to be able to report on the activity that we saw at the lower level. So from the test, we want to do pretty much the same thing but since now we're in the layer one test, we have a different sequence that we're running, but we still want to start that sequence on a sequencer. We also want to be able to have other sequences executing down in the protocol agent. So we still have to be able to get down to that sequencer in the agent and run other sequences there to do background traffic or whatever. So the real key to being able to set up this kind of an environment is being able to reuse the protocol agent as much as possible and that connection from the L1 sequencer down to the agent sequencer is really the key to making this whole thing work. So to make this work, we need to set up a translation sequence that's going to run on the agent sequencer. And this is going to be responsible for taking the sequence item from L1 and turning it into a dot level agent sequence item. So we declare our translation sequence and parameterize it with the type of transaction that the driver is expecting. The translation sequence has a pointer to the upper level sequencer, so we call it up sequencer. This is just a nice standard convention to use. Notice that this sequencer is parameterized by the L1 item, which is the type of transaction at L1 that's going to then be converted into a dot level transaction in the translation sequence. So we construct it, and then in the body method, we need to declare an L1 item to receive from the upper level sequence and also create a dot transaction item because that's the thing that's going to be created to send downstream to the driver. So we call get next item on the upper level sequencer. Now note the syntax here. We're actually calling the get next item method of the sequencer. We're not using a port connection here because the translation sequence itself is a dynamic object. So we can't actually have a port there. So we just refer to the sequencer directly and call get next item. The semantics of that get next item call are exactly the same as if we went through the port, but the connection is a little simplified here. An alternative approach would be to add a seek item pull port to the sequencer and have the translation sequence call get next item through the sequencer's port. But this requires you to extend the UVM sequencer to add the port, and that can actually make things a bit more complicated than they need to be. So we get the item from the upper level sequencer, and then we need to disassemble that and turn it into however many DUT level transactions are required. So we call start item and fill in the DUT transaction with the appropriate fields from the upper level transaction. Then we call finish item in order to send the transaction to the driver. When we've transmitted all of the information from the L1 transaction, we signal to the upper level sequencer that we're done with that particular transaction just as a driver would. Now, as we saw in the earlier session on sequences, we can pass a response back up to the L1 sequencer if need be, but in general, we just do the get next item and item done for interacting with the upper level sequencer. So as far as the L1 sequencer is concerned, this translation sequence looks exactly like a driver.
The L1 sequence is exactly the same as if it were connected to a driver that were connected to the L1 bus, but the translation sequence lets us convert it further to the actual protocol bus that's connected to our DUT. And remember, we still have the option of running a protocol level sequence directly on the protocol agent to generate background traffic if we choose. Now that we've got stimulus out of the way, we need to implement the analysis side, which will show us what things are happening at the L1 layer. So we need to put in place what we call a reconstruction monitor. This does the inverse of the translation sequence. It basically takes the activity that's happening and being reported by the protocol level monitor and turning it back into transactions at the higher level. A reconstruction monitor is typically going to be extended from UVM subscriber, which provides the analysis export that will connect it to the protocol agent. And we're going to put an analysis port in it, so that can then be used to report the L1 items out to other parts of the test bench that need it. In the constructor of this monitor, we actually instantiate that new analysis port. And then in the connect phase of the environment, we connect the analysis export of the L1 monitor to the analysis port of the agent. Back in the monitor, in the write method, we simply write the code that is necessary to take the bus level transactions and turn them back into an L1 level transaction. We've omitted the code on the slide here, but you can actually see an example of this in the UVM cookbook. And then we write that transaction out the analysis port, so from there it can go to any other place in the test bench that needs that information. To make this look as if it's just another agent, we need to be able to put these things together into a single component. So we call this a layered agent. We simply extend UVM subscriber so that we have the built-in analysis export. It could be just a component, but then you'd have to put the export in yourself. So in the layered agent, we have the analysis port to communicate out. We have the monitor, we have the sequencer, and we have the translation sequence. We also have a pointer to the protocol agent so that we can access its sequencer. And these things are all part of the layered agent. In the build phase, we create the sequencer and the monitor and the analysis port. So now in the layered agents connect phase, we simply have to connect the top level analysis port to the L1 monitors analysis port and the monitors analysis export to our top level analysis export. The run phase is where we actually start the translation sequence. So we create the sequence and we fill in the pointer to the upper level sequencer, which is the sequencer that's part of the layered agent here. And then we start that translation sequence on the sequencer in the DUT agent. So that's why we have a pointer there as well. So that way the lower sequencer is accessed via the agent. So we don't have to fill in the pointer directly. We simply use the protocol agent pointer in the layered agent. So that way we're better able to reuse this layered agent if we want to use it with a different protocol agent. At the environment level, we simply connect these two components as usual. So in the connect phase of the environment, we set the agent pointer of the layered agent to be the protocol level agent connected to the bus. Then we connect the analysis port from the agent to the analysis export of the layered agent. And this gives us another agent that from the test looks like a typical agent. It has a monitor and a sequencer in there. We can execute sequences on the L1 sequencer but we connect it up to the bus level agent to do the translation sequence. From the test, we have the flexibility of starting sequences on either the L1 sequencer or on the bus level sequencer in the protocol agent. And we can extend this up as high as we want. So every layered agent has a pointer to the agent below it, and we can start a translation sequence on the lower level sequencer. We connect up the monitors, so for as many layers of the hierarchy as we have in the protocol, we can simply put in a layered agent there and we'll get the same structure all the way up and down the hierarchy. To simplify things, we can encapsulate as many layers as we need in a single component. We may not necessarily need to access every single layer of the protocol, so we can take from that the different layered agents and wrap them together so that from above it looks like just a single agent. This simplifies the environment because we don't have to connect those layers explicitly at the environment level. We have analysis ports at each level of the protocol, so if we need access to those, we can simply pull them out of the encapsulating agent, and the internal structure looks exactly the same. So we now have the L2 sequencer. It's still running the translation sequence on the L1 sequencer, but 
we now have the opportunity to bundle these things together so that from the environment, we're only instantiating the dot level agent and the layering agent. That layering agent happens to have multiple levels of protocol, but it's still just a single component. Another alternative we have is if we know that this layered protocol is always going to be used to access the bus, we can actually wrap the protocol agent in it as part of the layered agent. So in our layered agent, we have the sequencer, the monitor, the analysis port that we did before, but we also include the protocol agent in it directly. So we create an instance of that protocol agent as part of our layered agent, and then we can start the translation sequence on the protocol agent sequencer as we've done before. To summarize, every layered agent has a child sequencer for every non-leaf level of the protocol. It creates a translator sequence for every non-leaf level as well. That translator sequence gets started on the lower level sequencer, and the translator sequence always has a pointer back to the next higher level sequence in the chain. On the analysis side, every non-leaf level may have a reconstruction monitor where it takes transactions from the lower level and assembles them in whatever way is necessary to create transactions for the given level of the protocol. We also have to have a handle to the leaf level protocol agent because that's the lowest level sequencer on which we're going to run our translation sequence. So as long as we have that, we can now make these layered agents have as many layers as we want them to have. The protocol agent can be a child of the layered agent or it can be external, and that's completely up to you depending on the structure of your test bench. We should create an analysis port for each of the monitors and make them available to the outside world via an analysis port in the layering agent. And we usually have a configuration object associated with every agent, as we've talked about before. So in this particular case, a configuration object may include information about some of the other components that are connected, or information about what types of transactions need to be generated, or even whether certain analysis ports might need to be connected, or what have you. So every layering agent, like every component in the UVM, as we've talked about before, is configurable. So you create a configuration object to define how your particular layering agent is going to be used. And that concludes this session on layered sequences. Thank you very much for your attention, and please stay tuned for the next session, Writing and Managing Tests.